And I'll... Hey, everyone. Welcome to the live broadcast of Making of Sleepy Little Sailor. By the way, Luke, people can ask us questions. You can't see them, but okay. I will tell you if there's any comments or questions sometime along the way. And I'm just going to um, wait for a bit because... I don't even know if anybody's on here. Are All we right. on the right thing? Yeah. As we yeah. um as we just as we talk, can I yeah. be can I be Barbara Frum and you can be Peter Zosky? Oh, definitely. Or do you want to be Victor I, Maitland? I think Barbara is really more my style. I'm very kind of rational mm -hmm. and intellectual. One of the mo most favorite Barbara Frum moments was when she was interviewing Margaret Atwood. And talking and Betty Friedan and probably another uh, feminist and talking about um, what about love or something she said to the you know what about romance and Margaret Atwood goes would you give up your oh no she said what about passion and then Margaret Atwood says would you give up your career for a moment of passion Barbara. But I, I want to know what Barbara said. It was like commercial time. Oh, my God. <laughs> it That's was so awesome. Beautiful. <laughs> I can just picture Barbara saying, but I'm not talking about just a moment. I know. <laughs> talking about like maybe a whole night. A lifetime. <laughs> a lifetime of passion. <laughs> Give up my career. Uh, yeah, we're just shooting the shit here. I'm going to be more official now and welcome some folks to our second episode of the making of sleepy little sailor today i'm speaking with my pal luke Doucette, who of course is known for being one half of the rock duo whitehorse he's an incredible guitarist and from a young age he's been playing oh my god he when did you start like 13 or something he's a songwriter singer producer highly intelligent and a person of strong opinions, and I love that. And even though he changes his hair and clothes a lot, there's still something strongly at the core of that shape-shifting. So let me take you guys back to when I first met Luke. It was not around 1996. I knew a guy named Jason Grant who was in the music industry, and he worked for the band 5440. And I, I had met him about 10 years earlier in the mid-'80s when I was a teenager, and he was volunteering at CITR at UBC campus radio station. He saw me and my friend at a gig at the Student Union building, and um, he fell in love with my friend at first sight her name was Shaney and she was blonde and very cute she looked like she lived on you know in the house little house on the prairie and so he tried to woo us or woo her anyway by giving us a tour of the radio station and I thought it was so hilarious because meanwhile I knew that she would never go for him because she was a lesbian so alas no but 10 years later I gave my little demo tape to Jason because I knew he was in the music business. And he liked it, and he said, hey, you know what, there's this guy, Luke, and you should meet him because he's got a new project called Veal, and you guys are doing some of the same stuff. And so somehow before texts, mes messaging, and I must have just called Luke on the telephone maybe, um, we set up our musical blind date, and it was in a downtown Vancouver diner called S'il vous plaît. And I remember walking in the diner and Luke was sitting at the counter and he was sitting on one of those little round stools, probably looking super cool. And he looked like a little mini Robert Plant with long curly hair, like past his shoulders. And I just thought, I'm doing the same thing as that guy. OK, <laughs> he looks like a rocker. And uh, so I, re I remember walking there and he was super serious. Luke was very serious. He was probably 23 at the time and had already been playing for about eight years professionally. He just spent the last four years or so, correct me if I'm wrong, probably I have the, the numbers wrong, but he had been playing with Sarah McLaughlin on tour, living the so-called dream, except he wasn't satisfied. He, he was quitting and now focusing on his own musical projects, which was called Veal. So 
Luke, it felt like at the time when I was sitting next to you on the little bar stool at the diner that you were kind of at this crossroads of in your life. Like it felt like veal was your way of choosing your own path and putting yourself front and center instead of being on the side, which I think was driving you a bit crazy at the time. Do you think that's right? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. Um, I mean, you, you've just given me more nostalgic recollections of that time in my life than I probably had in my entire brain. Um, <laughs> Sorry. No, it's great. No, it's great. I, I loved Cafe Civo Play. That little place was fantastic. It was like the last holdout of a family run diner in downtown Vancouver. Totally. I mean, now it's, it's gone now, but it, I remember going in there at, at the tail end of it and looking outside at those massive glass structures that looked like Hong Kong and thinking this little, this humble little diner doesn't have, is not long for this world. But um, yeah, I mean, partly to do with what it's like to be that age. I was 23, I guess, at the time. If it was 96, that's the year my daughter Chloe was born. And so I would yeah. have been tw 23. She wasn't born yet. It was pretty exciting because you were like, yeah, I'm, my girlfriend's going to have a baby. And I was like, oh, my goodness. Like, I was yeah. so not, I was older than you, but I was still like, holy crap. And you're yeah. like, yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but I think part of being that that age is that everything is so serious when you're in your early 20s, ironically. Yes. Because we think of you know, footloose and fancy free young people not having a care in the world. But I cared so much about everything, way too much. I mean, I still care about things too much, but... Um, but yeah, I think so. The fact that I didn't necessarily feel completely and totally satisfied in my position in Sarah's band, um, at least for a 23 year old, 23 year old felt like the kind of thing that required some rebelling against. I look back now and it seems silly. There was nothing to rebel against. Sarah was a friend who gave me a chance to play great music and I love her for it. Um, but at the time, I felt the need to like sort of declare myself and find find a thing that was personal. And that, that and yeah, Veal was that. I mean, it's also the mid '90s, and you know, I had been listening to the Flaming Lips and Dinosaur Junior, and uh, um, I don't know, lot, lots of music More of the time. More aggressive music, you mean? Yeah, and, like and music that was that was really had as part of its modus operandi to challenge the things that had come before in a fairly aggressive way. Mm -hmm. And that was part of my at my identity at the time is like, what could I, it wasn't transgressive, but there was an element of rebellion about the spirit of it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's true. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, yeah, that, that band had, had that at its core, I think is that's true. And had you, st when I met you, like you may not remember exactly when we met, but had Luke, had Veal been going, I know you had recorded like Mexico, Texaco, mm -hmm. and a bunch of other songs. And I still have the cassette. It's in Toronto, unfortunately. I wish I could have it and go like, there it is. <laughs> but um, I did take a photo of it and send it. Sent it. To, I think I sent it or put it on the social media. And Melissa was like, I want that so much. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so you'd been together enough. But I think the people had changed a little bit like you kind of had solidified in it a few years later and I knew it as the trio but maybe hmm. Barry was in it at that time and I mean these are all people oh, yeah. but had you guys played any gigs or was it just a recording project at that point no we had definitely played gigs because I remember thinking isn't it going to be amazing that the first veal record is going to come out at the same time that my daughter does oh wow yeah That's so we had been a band and we yeah. had played a bunch of shows and done, and, and rehearsed way too much, tons of rehearsing. That was a thing we did, and uh, and then the record took a while before it came out. But no, we had been. I don't know how much we had played, but we had certainly played some gigs. Right, which is kind of more than I could say because I think at that time I'd done really very little at all. I mean, comparatively speaking, I was like I'd played like three or four or five times probably when I met you on stage, whereas you had been doing that since you were a kid really and um yeah but maybe it i mean it's interesting like w for those people who don't play music i mean there's a definite uh separation or difference between being a side man and being a front man um like in terms of st of course with music but also 
like what you're trying to achieve musically, but also with the state of mind. It's like a, a completely different part of your brain or something. Do you agree with that? Like how was, I think that's what, when I interpret how you were at the time, you're like, I want to change my focus to being not necessarily the front man because Veal was kind of egalitarian in a certain way, especially in the way you set up on stage because everybody was featured equally. Um, and I know that you're somewhat of a, a, a communist in a, <laughs> so, uh, in a, in a <clears throat> kind of a strange mix of communist capitalist dude. But, um, anyway, but what, I mean, you had been a sideman for years and had you done anything that was your own project before Veal? Well, not in the sense of recording and, and, uh, I mean, I, I had, um, you know, I had fronted bands that were playing blues in bars in Winnipeg when I was a teenager. I had, um, I put together a little band of some friends in East Van when I first moved there before I went on the road with Sarah. And we started recording some demos to see what would happen with that. Um, but really, Veal was the first time I was like, okay, this is the thing we're going to do. And then let's, let's write some songs and let's record them and let's see if we can go on tour and play shows. Like that, was, that was definitely the first, first time I had made that a priority for sure. Yeah. I mean, I had been on the road with Acoustically Inclined, which was this kind of like gypsy jazz meets new grass revival um, psychedelic jam band mm. thing. And we toured a ton. We did five or six cross Canada tours in like a year and a half um, before I moved to the West Coast. Uh, but, and in that band, I wrote a couple of songs. And um, so I, was, I had, I had, spent time being a singer and I had spent time being a songwriter, but I was always also a side person. Mm -hmm. And I, and I agree with what you say about the different headspace. It's a very different headspace. And uh, I still deeply appreciate and respect both today. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't have the same burning desire to, um, to emphasize one at the expense of the other. I don't feel the need to expunge either of those things from my life. I really love the honor. And I mean that sincerely, that comes when somebody whose music you respect um, says, would you help me make a thing? Whether that's as a guitar player or as a producer or a backup singer or a percussionist or whatever it is you're asked to come and be a part of. I just like, it's the most humbling honor, truly, like hyperbole aside, that that uh, somebody can bestow upon you as a, as a, as an artist or a musician or a player or a whatever. It's like, please mm -hmm. come into my very personal space and um, contribute to a very personal and very important, meaningful project. I just think it's the most mm -hmm. incredible thing. Yeah. I, 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 I will always hold a little bit of space in my brain and in my life to share that with other people, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. from the other side of it, I mean, that's a really good segue to talking more specifically about recording Sleepy Little Sailor, but I don't want to miss out on some other th talking points, which is, well, for me, the thing that was so, I mean, how we started playing together was that um, our managers put us on tour together. And so it was like three years after we had first met and, uh, we did some tours and Veal played a set. I think I can't remember if we alternated order or whatever, if I played first, then you guys played and then we played together or something. I can't remember exactly, but just that you guys were kind of one of the early band experiences I ever had. So you were one of the first, like really only guitar player aside from David Baxter, maybe was that you were the, maybe the only other guitar player to ever had playing hmm. with me. And which I must say is pretty fucking amazing because you're so good and you're so fun. And the thing about it that makes it so exciting is that you're so prepared, but you're so prepared that you can just throw the map away. So it's like, oh my God, I'm gonna really feel this moment with Luke. He's gonna play so loud 
which is, I love that. <laughs> I'm I, like, sorry. I kind of cut my teeth on that. So if anybody's not loud, I'm like, what's going on? Where are you? And um, so that, it, you're right, that it's a very personal thing to invite someone into, especially if you're a singer-songwriter, you're like, oh my God, this is my, even if it's not about you or autobiographical there's something so personal about it um at least mm -hmm. from my point of view and so when it came time to making my second record because i didn't really know you bef for the first one um so yeah i guess i had played with bob egan david baxter and you and um maybe a few others but not regularly. And when it came time to making Sleepy Little Sailor, I really wanted you to be there. Um, and maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, what you remember from the session, if you do, if you remember anything, or just the feeling of it, maybe. Well, the first, yeah. Um, I mean, first of all, just as a little bit of background, into what I, how aware I might have been about your music. Um, it's funny you mentioned that I might be a bit of a communist. Uh, I certainly used to think I was. Um, <laughs> I know you're not. I, truly. <laughs> I, I'm not convinced I would pay lip service to that anymore. But I, I lived in a in a in a communal. I lived in an urban commune in Vancouver, and uh, it was just a place where 40 people. Like it looked like a condo building from the outside, but it was a place where 40 people lived together. And um, they were divided up into into suites or apartments, or maybe they even called them pods, like whales. That's possible, or peas. Um, <laughs> and uh, and they had the other round windows. Yep. Yeah. Uh, it it was cool. It was a great place. To have. Uh, great great place for a whole lot of things. But anyway, um, one of my roommates, flatmates, pod mates, uh, was a woman named Lindsay Popes who uh, is still a friend and she was a, she had great taste in music and she played Johnstown all the time. And I was just like, what is this record? It was so, it, it blew me away. I was so moved by it. We probably listened to it every day for six months. Wow. Um, so I had a deep abiding appreciation and respect for what you had done um, before I played on, before we did Sleepy Little Sailor. Uh, so when just getting invited to be a part of it uh was uh, it was a huge honor so i went into that record with that it wasn't like okay i'm gonna go do a session because i'd done a whole bunch of sessions at that point um on people's records and and i re respected everybody but yours was the first record other than working with sarah uh, mclaughlin where um i was playing with somebody whose whose music i'd already heard and loved so it's a different kind of thing than having a local person in the music scene say, "Hey, can you come and help me make play on my on my record?" This was this was an album that I, you know, you're, you as an artist and 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 Johnstown um, were that was work that I that I held up against Amy Lou Harris or against the Stones or whatever I happened to. It was just, those are records that I listened to when I listened to music so that I had feelings, not so that I could learn things about production or guitar playing, but just mm. to like have a drink and have a feeling about music and then love music. Uh, so I think that's important to note. But so I went into the session with that, 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 um, that spirit. Um, and I cared a great deal about uh, everything about it. Um, the songs and the sounds and who was on the session. And it was just such the whole, it was, it was very, I was very charmed by the whole scene and very moved by it. Um, now the fact that Colin was also going to produce the record, and Colin's a guitar player that I that I've always respected and loved, um, was also added, added sort of a degree of uh, humility to the whole situation, um, because I had spent more than a little bit of time in my life trying to figure out how to be Colin Cripps. That was a thing. You, you'd go and see him play with whichever band he was playing through when he would pass through Winnipeg you know and, and play at the spectrum or wherever and you'd go and go and watch and myself and all of my guitar player buddies would just be at the lip of the stage like staring at his pedals and his amp and listening to the sounds that came out of it and being like this is such a beautiful thing you know there were it's like this is like listening to george harrison and 
um, Johnny Marr all at, you know at the same time. Like it was such a, an amazing, amazing thing. So to be in the studio with him, sort of standing there scratching his beard and like, you know, <laughs> being the I, philosopher ideas man, or at least your your, your partner in crime in, in that department, uh, was also fantastic. You know, and, and terrifying, but but mm -hmm. but wonderful because Colin has a way of of um, instilling confidence. He has a way of making you feel like what you bring to the table is valued. You know, and I've, I he's I, I feel like that's a thing that he has a he has a, a capacity for empathy that is um, beautiful, and it it uh, is very conducive to to extracting musical vulnerability from the people in the room. That's a gift. I totally agree with that. I mean, he was. That was one of the reasons why I wanted to work with him was that he built this trust and he understood how kind of fragile he could be. I mean, he's a very sensitive person. So I think, he, he, you know, some people who are sensitive can cover that up with a lot of bravado, but he's not like that. He's very humble and yet decisive and knows what he wants uh, and kind of has certain things like this is what we want to do and this is what we're not going to do. But he, he said to me, you know, just a few weeks ago, one of the reasons, one of the ways I wanted to build trust with you was that when I wanted you to come after the band, including you, you know, all of us had played a take of the song. He's like, I wanted you guys to all come in and have the sounds be almost like they're mixed. Uh -huh. And so you're not questioning the sound quality or what you're doing. You're just feeling it. And, under, and analyzing it emotionally. And then you could go back in and do another take and respond to it. And he was like, I just didn't want any doubts in anybody's mind about what it sounded like. He's like, I wanted it to be super loud <laughs> and, you know, all EQ'd and everything. He's like, I just want to, I told Ken, who was the engineer, like, please make sure that when they listen back, they're going to hear this beautiful thing and that's how i'm gonna make them get more engaged yeah i uh i really appreciate that and the, the more i when i make records either as a, an artist or a producer or whatever if, if i'm in control of anything at all um i try to set up a situation that's not unlike what you're talking about but i think that uh, there's a metaphor that that i've used before that comes to mind and i think that what you just described about colin and about you and Colin and the process you wanted to establish and, and particularly in terms of having us sit down and listen and feel like things were already, they already felt like they were there, that there was an immediacy. Um, I've used the metaphor of wanting to, wanting to have the shortest possible cable, hmm. you know, like between my, but also between your mind and the people's ears that are going to hear what you're making. Hmm. Um, like if I think about guitar players that I love, I think about somebody like Gary Clark Jr., who's a, a guitar player I've sort of fallen in love with in the last few years. Um, or, or uh, well, anyway, let's use him as an example. I mean, Colin's another guy actually who would fit the bill. It, it, you, it's like you can, there's not a lot of distance one feels between the genesis of the idea and your ears. Mm. There's not a lot of distortion and a lot of noise and a lot of traffic between those two things. Um, so there's an impulse, a musical impulse or an emotional impulse. And, and hopefully that the distance between that impulse and what it feels like to consume it uh, on, a, on a piece of music is very immediate and very short. And it's an imperfect analogy because they, they all are, but, but I, I, it, it's one I can't shake. And sometimes, sometimes literally my approach to playing is like, well, let's get rid of the, the, the stuff we don't need. And sometimes that's literally get rid of, get, let's get rid of pedals. Let's get mm -hmm. rid of extra stuff. Let's take the whammy bar off the guitar. Let's just go the cable into that amplifier, turn it up. That's a great sound. Let's go with that Sim simplicity. Um, and when I listen to Sleepy Little Sailor, you know, I can hear delay on guitars on the opening track uh, which is which is Sleepy Little Sailor, and I can hear um, a slapback delay that I used on on um, King's Road, which is kind of more of a '50s thing, which I loved. Uh, there's a few little things like that 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 that, but basically it was guitar into amplifier, turn it up so it sounds great. That's a great sound, um, and that that philosophy, uh, whether it's how you get a guitar tone or just how you envision the immediacy of hearing something, I think is a valuable thing. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know if I thought so, you know, literally two years before we made Sleepy Little Sailor. Mm. You know, I was thinking about Radiohead and how do we have the most expansive sounds that you can imagine with as many pedals and as many unidentifiable things as possible. But when, but your record was the first record other than the Veal stuff that I had ever been a part of where I was like, I, that thing I love about Mick Taylor with the Stones when he plays with Bob Dylan or that thing I love about, um, um, Lucinda Williams and her records is just that, that there's, there's, it's, there's not a lot to hide behind mm. and you get the sense that nobody wants to hide. Like, it's like this, the warts, the warts are, are, they're not a bug. They're a feature. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I yeah. felt like your, your record was an invitation to be that exposed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it, <laughs> Yeah, it's true. There's a lot of spontaneous moments that we did not plan at all. Mm-hmm. Well, I would say most of most, most of, of it. Them. <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean certainly from my perspective, most of yeah. what I I stumbled upon was all accidental. It was all improvisation. I know it was really cool. It's actually really cool to me because I was thinking about the record and I was like, actually, Luke and I are the ones that are kind of starting the album on that song right like you and i are the one you know i play that was a part i think there was some overdubbing with that opening uh cool guitar that you added onto there i think that was a little bit of uh you know we did very few overdubs but that was one and but it just sets the mood for the album i mean i didn't really know what i was going to call the record it was only after we had recorded everything that I really mulled over what I would call it and how I would sculpt it. And, but it's kind of the perfect opening few bars was just to have us and the space around it. Um, it just creates this, okay, here we're, here we Mm -hmm. go. We're going to go into this dreamy spot. Um, and there's a lot I could ask you about, but I think that um, one thing you mentioned was when we talked earlier bef- off camera and off this platform, you were saying it was one of the first times you'd felt like you were being hired for you, which is so, so true. I really am the kind of, why I chose the people, the band was so that they could just play how they naturally play. I, I, in a way it was from laziness because I didn't really know how to change people and I didn't really want to, I mean, not laziness, but just this feeling of why would you get someone there and then try to change what they did? So I'm going to get people that I know that they have mm-hmm. a soul that resides here. And yet that didn't seem strange to me. That seemed normal because I was so inexperienced and I'd not, I'm not a side person, so... Uh, but you were talking about how sometimes you have to be a chameleon when you're a side person to fit into someone else's thing. And I was just wondering how you even knew that. Like, was that something I just, I told you, or was it something that you just felt that the personnel were picked because of how talented they were, but also for their uniqueness? I mean, thank you for framing it that way, you know, unique and talented. I'll take, I'll take that. But I also think (laughs) it's, it's maybe just a stylistic thing. I just, I had a kinship with a certain, you know, I could be not particularly unique and not particularly talented, but I could still, you could. You've been in my wheelhouse or in a person's wheelhouse and that, you know, and I feel like uh, that was also at play. Like I just feel a personal connect. Like when I hear those songs, I listen to the record again today. Um, and when I heard Johnstown beforehand, the way I felt was, I'm in this. This is this is this is my spiritual strike zone from a, from a musical perspective. And I sit, you know, and if anybody who knows much about me will laugh at listening to me talk about myself in such terms. But um, but I mean, like it, I felt such a kinship with where I think, where I thought you were coming from. And of course I was right in some ways and I was wrong in other ways, but either way, there was enough, the Venn diagram between those things was, there was enough of it that I wasn't that wrong if I was wrong. Like I might've been thinking that you were thinking Elvis Costello and you're like, no, it's Joe Jackson, obviously. (laughs) 
I don't know. <laughs> um, but it's like, okay, close enough. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so there was just a good fortune. I mean, it's good fortune. Also, somebody had some prescience and you and Colin and it to be like, well, let's, these are the people that would be, that would be the right, the right thing. I mean, you could have gotten a fancy session player who can do ab absolutely everything. And, and you could have said, listen to these five records and come in with that in mind. And there are people who could have done that. But in, in my case, you just happen to choose, you just happen to, uh, you, it's just the thing that I would do on, on my, those are the, the things I brought to the table are the things I, that I, if I'm in my dressing room before a show and I'm playing my guitar just to entertain myself, I play the way I played on your record. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what we, we wanted. We never told you not to. We were like, yeah. Right. Yeah. Except you got, you and Colin, and I just have this beautiful image of you guys hunched over your guitars. Like I, after we had done the take and we were going to fill in some textures and solos, you guys worked together and, and the rest of us could kind of mill around in the studio and, and relax. But I would watch you guys with your white t-shirts on hunched over the guitars. And it really was like this cool big brother, little brother thing with your physical size. It's not that Colin's a huge person, um, but there was this, physical difference but a similarity in how you guys looked and um and just the love of the guitar overtaking you and then um but you know it was so it was so beautiful to watch that mm -hmm. um and I guess we were talking also about how you know you got to play all these vintage guitars that Colin had for the session. I mean, you know, he's before I even met Colin, he lent me for Johnstown. He, I don't even think I knew him. He's like, here guys, if you need these, you know, 19 something Johnny cash used to own this Martin here. And I didn't even meet him. It was like brokered by Alex, who was my manager. And so we had, he's, this collector and has all these vintage guitars. And yet it was so funny because when we went on tour together, you had those two harmony guitars and it was almost like, were those exactly the same guitars? Yep. And it was like, you had the main and you had the spare and everybody who's a collector and kind of a connoisseur might go, you know, Oh, those harmonies, they're of a lesser quality than this fender or gibson or whatever mm -hmm. but you were like i want this scrappy old shitty thing and yeah. why <laughs> that's such a i'm so glad you asked that question <clears throat> and there, there's so when i moved to vancouver from winnipeg um and i had i had spent years doing a whole bunch of different things i played in a, in a, in a, a latin band with a bunch of people oh, from wow. nicaragua and el salvador and guatemala and mexico many of whom were refugees uh, and we were playing cumbias and lambadas and salsas and and um, you know like, like they were they were they were playing traditional Latin American music with a bit they were but you know sometimes it was pop music sometimes it was Santana I played um, with acoustically inclined I described earlier and I but I had also spent a bunch of years playing blues um, and the blues can be a little bit of a ghetto sometimes because you can get sort of stuck in it and it's hard to like not it's not because I don't think blues musicians can be uh, as broad and varied as any others. It's because sometimes people have an, an attitude about that. It's like, oh, well, they just do that. And then it's just it, people can be a bit dismissive of that music. Um, own, uh, much to their own loss, as far as I'm concerned, because it's rich. Uh, but when I got to Vancouver, I didn't want anybody to know that had been my background. And so I figured I would, the, for me, the best thing to do was to get rid of my Strat. Because I had a Fender Strat. Why I, didn't you I want thought, well, if I get know? rid of this, because I, I wanted to do other things as well. Oh, okay. My plan was I'm going to do other things. And then when they're least expecting it, I'll introduce that part of myself sometime later. Like right. I want to put it away and then I want to come back to it later. And it's funny in my life, I have actually done that. I've, I've come back to the blues with, with a deep and abiding love mm -hmm. after 20 years of not really playing it at much at all. Yeah. Um, and, and now I, I have found a way to, in, to integrate it into my, my life in a, in a way that's, I think, really beautiful. I hope really beautiful. I certainly enjoy it. But at the time, I thought, well, I have to, 
I don't want people to, to put me in that box. So I thought I have to do. So I, so I stopped playing the Strat and I went into not the music shop on Granville Street in Vancouver. And I just walked in and one of those harmonies was hanging on the wall. And I thought, wow, that's, that looks amazing. And I plugged it in. I played one chord on it and it sounded completely unlike anything I'd ever heard, but I loved the sound of it. I was like, great, I'll, I, I will buy that guitar. And then it just became a thing that I, I used so much and I learned how to play it. And they're weird guitars. They're not, they are limiting in terms of what they will do because most guitars, as you know, they taper like up where the neck, where the neck joins the body, they're this wide. And then down at the nut, by the, they're this wide. So they, they taper all the way down the neck, which is, facilitates the ease of playing. The harmonies didn't do that. They were just perfectly straight up and down. So, and, and they were considered sort of entry level student models that were all built at the, the Sears Roebuck factory, I think out of in Chicago. So whether they were called Silvertone or Harmony, they were all basically the same guitars made mostly with plywood and with cheaper parts. Um, but if you could wrestle the thing into subservience, they sounded fantastic. I mean, you had a silver tone, a Jupiter. I still or one. have it. It's, I it's don't a know great guitar. It's that black. It's yeah, the one it's, that Bahamas, I think, has. Too, right, or... that Afy's got one. Yeah. But I think I think on, on Sleepy Little Sailor, the opening of that of that record, that's you on your silver tone. Is and it? I, I, I don't think, remember. I'm pretty sure I you were playing that. I don't think I did play that. I think oh, I really? played, yeah, I think I played some other fancy guitar. Never let the truth I'm get sorry. in the way of a good story. You're right, you're right. I did play that. <laughs> sorry. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> when we played live, for sure I would play that. Yeah, that's and that's a great guitar. But so so I just, there was a charm about finding pawn shop guitars. And uh, I mean, was it was it Bo Diddley? I feel like it was either Bo Diddley who said in the Blues Brothers, or I'm, I'm mixing up these references, but but I feel like I'm gonna ascribe this to Bo Diddley who said, if it ain't been in a pawn shop, it don't play the blues. You know, and I, I think that's adorable. You mean like don't, on the guitar? If the, the guitar, record, if, the, if the guitar is, hasn't been in a pawn shop. You can't play the blues on it. Right. Which I love. it actually hasn't and had any sadness instilled <laughs> into the and guitar. What could be sadder than a pawn shop? <laughs> totally, some dude had to give up his <laughs> oh, guitar. Devastating. So, so yeah, so uh, so I just loved the 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 kitschiness of these weird old guitars that didn't sound like anything else. Um, yeah, and and I and I found a way to to play them. I mean, you're not wrong. The reaction people had that those were garbage guitars, and I should play. I should grow up and and play or play real guitars. I mean, when I was out on the road with Sarah McLaughlin, the same thing happened. I had a bunch of pawn shop pawn shop specials on tour, and my guitar tech came to me one time and he said, you know. Uh, your guitars don't intonate very well, and your play, your some of your stuff doesn't sound like it's entirely in tune, which I resent and I d don't agree. I think I played them in tune, but the point he was making was, can you get some new guitars, like just a yeah. couple of brand new ones, so that they intonate perfectly and the frets are all perfect, and I give it the electronics all work. And that's when I started playing the Gretches, which I which I love and play oh. them play them now i ordered it out of the uh, like off the ca out of the catalog a gretch catalog i was like uh, he said what do you want well like this is a huge tour we can get you whatever you want from the company i said well i want one of those big stupid white things that neil young plays i want one of those and Did two you weeks even know what it sounded like other than what neil young was doing i knew that gretch's sounded great i had heard crowded house i had heard neil finn play one in crowded house i had heard greg keeler with blue rodeo playing gretch guitars uh, and I, I knew that was an amazing sound. And so I was like, you know, I don't know if the Falcon is the one or the 6120 or the Tennessean or the whatever, but I knew that the Gretsch guitar with those kind of pickups had a sound. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, had this shape that was similar to the harmonies in a way. I mean, yeah. I, I know they're way thinner, those harmonies. Yeah. But, but you're right. The, the fifties kind of like rockabilly aesthetic also yeah. appealed, appealed to me. Yeah. And I know that you love it cause it's hard to play. Yes, I, I mean, I, 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 I feel like if you don't, if you don't, if you can't fight with the thing, it's not going to sound good. I, I don't love know. That. I mean, well, if I was, yeah. it is like you wrestle with it. Like I remember seeing you yeah. play from the early days before I really knew you, and you would just be hunched over, like so deep over your guitar. I think you were playing with Tammy. What was it, Tammy Greer or something? Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was just like. <laughs> Yeah, Ew. that was, that's what fear looks like. <laughs> no way. Come on. 
<laughs> I guess you were about 19 or no, no, you were 20. You were, I had met you already. So you were 23 mm. and you had a lot of years under your belt. You weren't scared. Were you, do you have stage fright? No, not stage fright. Uh, no, it, it's not stage fright. It's fear of the fear of, uh, the music, there's a yeah. part of celebrating music that involves so much respect that it's almost akin to fear, I think. Oh, wow. It's like, I want this to be, it's not that I want it to be perfect. Mm -hmm. I want it to be imp imperfect. I want it to be so spirited and so spontaneous and so right when it lands. But you have to take huge risks. I mentioned Greg Keeler before. You know, Greg takes massive risks in his playing. And when, it, when he lands where he wants to land, it's a thing of unparalleled beauty. Mm -hmm. And and Mark Rebo, I would describe the same way. Mark Rebo, who played on all those Tom Waits records from the early from the eighties that I love, people take massive risks, and and when they pull off what they're trying to pull off, I mean, if if you're paying close enough attention, you should have sweat beads on the back of your neck. And I, <laughs> I, I this is part of it for me. That's amazing. I love that. I mean, that so, shows so much when I. You know, when I'm playing with you, um, which doesn't happen too often, but it, I know that that you don't really know what's going to happen when I'm playing. Yeah. I don't really know I, what's going to happen. I just I know it's going to be amazing. Susie. I'm like, hmm, what's going to happen now? I know it's going to be in the, and I mean this in the, like, full of respect for the song, but also like, hair. Let's go fucking crazy now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I, I have, yeah, I have had, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad that that the spirit of that is part of what you like, and I know that you have, like, your background, listening to Outlaw Country and listening to the Rolling Stones and with punk rock and, and new wave. Like when I think about what I know about you and your childhood and the music you like and the spirit of rebellion and, um, you know, that that's that some of those things work for you philosophically. But I have been told by people that I work for sometimes, hey, um, can you be more predictable yeah. and more conservative? Yeah, do the parts or something. Yeah, yeah. and, and, and I, you know, I, I saw Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers play at the Air Canada Centre one time, and I love when guitar players go off and do their own thing and don't follow the roadmap of the albums they've made, but Mike Campbell played every note right off the records, and I loved every second of it. It was such a thing of beauty because I was just, I was singing along to every single guitar note mm -hmm. and like, what a celebration. So mm -hmm. I, I can go either way. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I, I think that if, if we did a show, you and I, or if I, if you did a show and I played guitar with you um, and, you know, River Blue happened, I would probably play every note like it is on the record because I, because I love those parts. Well, that solo is amazing. I remember, um, I remember you guys having like, to choose between a whole bunch of solos or you know first part of this solo is amazing second half of that solo is amazing but that Colin was a stickler he's like no you just got to play it all the way through and you got to do it great and no editing here mm -hmm. and uh yeah he made he made you sweat I know <laughs> yeah no shit Fuck. he's like nope <laughs> You got to just do it. Yeah. I know you can. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is awesome. Thank you so much for a really mm. nice conversation. Oh, and, it's a what, a what an honor. Um, and what are you guys doing right now? You guys have like three records in the can. White Horse has been so busy. Yeah. And you guys are going to master three different styles of records. Yeah. Which is incredible. Yeah, we, um, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't fault anybody for merely surviving the last six months of life, you know, mm. with all that's been going on in the world, you know, even, even just, um, COVID alone, you know, I think it's yeah. been hard on people. And I, I, I was fortunate enough that when I started to lose my mind and I was sitting right where I'm sitting now in my kitchen in Toronto and, um, you know, I would put Jimmy to bed at nine 30, Jimmy's our, as you know, our, my son, but um, he's, he just turned six years old. So, so Melissa and I would put him to bed at 9.30 or so, and then I would usually fall asleep and wake up around 11, 11.30, and then I would crack a beer, start listening to some country records, sit right here with a guitar, and usually by four in the morning, I would have a song. 
that I had wow. written. And I did that 25 or 30 times between Jeez. April and May. Um, and so there was a record coming out uh, that of those songs, Melissa. So I write, typically what happens is in order for me to get five or 10 songs that I think are really strong, I have to write 20 or 30. And then Melissa writes six and they're, they're perfect. All they're beautiful. <laughs> uh, that's, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm long past the point of resenting her for that. <laughs> but uh, so we just wrote a whole bunch of songs and we ended up with three records. We made a rock and roll record and we made a, a really intimate um record i don't know what else, how else to refer to it it's expansive it's i think it's beautiful i hope it's beautiful it's personal it's uh, there's some autobiography in that record quite a bit oh, that's cool and then we made this this country record um which i think is funny that you call it country because when i think of country now it's not what you mean no right? of course no for sure no I, I i i i guess i should qualify um it's the kind of country music that you might like i think it's i brian ahern produced a bunch of i mean all the emmy lou harris records from mid 70s until into the 90s everything that um Anne murray recorded for about 15 20 years Oh, wow. uh, he, I mean, he's done a, if you look him up, he's done a ton of stuff, but yeah, it turns out yeah. he's from, he's from Halifax, uh, but he, he lives in Anne Nashville now, but he's a Canadian. He was, yeah, he did the, like most of what you know about Anne-Marie is also Brian Ahern. Hmm. So I kind of did a deep dive on that. I listened to a lot of John Prine. I listened to a lot of, um, I listened to a lot. Uh, oh God, I could, I could go on all, all day. I listened to a lot of Lyle Lovett. I listened to a lot of Dwight Yoakam. I listened to so much Emmy Lou, like probably every other day I would just go, deep on Emmylou yeah. and uh, and came up with a record that I, I, we ended up coming up with a record that we wanted to be, we wanted it to, it to be sort of squarely in the, in sort of the disco era of country. Like what, and, and not that all, <laughs> there's a couple of songs that are kind of disco country, like Dolly Parton. That. You know, like when you listen to Joe Lee. The four on the floor. Just boom, just boom, just, you know, that, yeah. that like, but with a country thing happening underneath it. And I kind of think Jolene, I think Dolly Parton invented disco. Like, I don't think she gets the credit <laughs> that she deserves. Cause if you, if you listen to Jolene, it's, it's got a, it's got a funky kind of bass and a halftime drum groove. Oh, and then wow. this beautiful little acoustic guitar banjo situation is Joe. Like, and that was 73. So I think, I think like, I think Dolly invented disco, which is amazing. But also you think about nine to five or islands in the stream. Yeah. You know, so that. Well, the Bee Gees were so disco. Eventually, sure. Right? Yeah. But the country disco blend is a special little That's thing that amazing. happened. I'm such yeah. a fan of that. Uh, so there's a little bit of that on that record. And then there's just stuff that would be sort of inspired by, um, by, uh, the country artists uh, from the seventies, you know, and, and, legends and 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 the sort of birth of americana um artists as well you know just sort of depending on on uh who i was listening to that night but i you know john prime died in the midst of that two-month period and i wrote a ton oh, of songs wow. trying to be john prime which is ridiculous you That's should never try point. to be john prime yeah well but it's a good thing to i think copying leads to innovation i i do too yeah um, yeah. What was I going to ask you? I had a good question, then it escaped me. Oh, maybe uh, does anybody have a question for us? I mean, all the masses out there, do you guys have questions for Luke or for me about any part of this interview? Or just do you want to say anything? People have said some really nice things like, it's great to be here. Jude, of course, saying, I'm loving this so much. You're both so eloquent. I like hearing these stories. Yes, I knew that uh, talking to Luke was going to be very nice and special. I mean, everybody I'm going to talk to has really a lot of things to say. What I love is that people have passionate ideas about music and everything else about it. And, the, and what I find so interesting, which we all take for granted as music fans and music makers, is that sound creates emotion for us and it's interesting to get into the minutia of all that stuff like especially with someone like Luke I can talk to him about the disco country that he loves right like and that and how it makes you feel it's you know mm. you can describe it with words but really it's all about this kind of how in 
how it in, is injected into your skin or into your soul. Or I mean, you can use the, even the, those words sound really cheesy, but it's this thing where it goes into your ears. Like, why is this? Why does a sound make us feel certain things? Of course, mm-hmm. you could probably say there's some evolutionary reason, reason but um, that it's so it's so fun to be in a room with people making a record because everybody is so they don't agree but they're so attuned to what sounds do to Mm -hmm. us and um you know and then there's funny jokes that we can play like how about this ridiculous sound ha 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 like the totally the inappropriate sound for what you're doing which makes everybody laugh their asses off. Like, how about playing this weird wah-wah pedal on this beautiful little thing, even though sometimes it works. Or yeah. how about a BTO riff? <laughs> or your, like your Strat thing. Like, I, like I'll say, can you do this? And you'll be like, you'll probably like play some, you know, Stevie Ray Vaughan thing. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, but no. <laughs> and um, yeah. And, oh, someone does have a question. Okay, good, because I'm gonna um, I'm gonna wrap this up soon. So, Lori Aitken, I would love to know what inspired Luke to become a musician. That's a whole book. Was mm. there a desire to play guitar? Was the desire to play guitar always there? And what would be the alternate alternate career choice? I read on Wikipedia that you wanted to be a lawyer. <laughs> uh, well. I wanted to be a lawyer because I didn't know what a lawyer was. Right. And what I wanted to, what it really meant was I wanted to do something that would involve arguing with people. <laughs> I uh, and I could have been, uh, uh, you know, today it would mean being an evolutionary biologist, I think. Um, <laughs> but um, I wanted to, I always knew that music when I was in the second grade at L'Ecole Sacré-Cœur in, in, in Winnipeg, which was a French immersion school, there was a choir and I, you know, it was an option to be in the choir and I decided to be in the choir. And I learned pretty quickly that I could sing high and that I could find harmonies quickly. And so I quickly was put in a position of s- singing solos. And every year we would do a, a, a concert at the Winnipeg Art Gallery or somewhere we'd go and do a concert at Christmas time doing Christmas carols. And I would have, you often have a featured part. And, um, and, uh, I, so I was like, oh, I, I have an aptitude for this thing. Like I can hear harmonies and find melodies and I can sing really high and I'm always in tune and I feel good about this. It's a good feeling. Um, and I, I was actually telling my, my friend Ruth, uh, recently that, um, I had a girlfriend from grades two to grade six. Her name was, um, and she, uh, I used to, I remember being at the bus stop one day and whistling the theme songs to all the TV shows that I had seen. And I thought that was some skill that she'd be so impressed with. <laughs> such a, I was such an annoying kid. And so I would like whistle the theme song to like Mark and Mindy or <laughs> Littlest Hobo. Can you do like this now? was some kind of skill. No, I would never <laughs> dare. Of course, don't be ridiculous. Uh, but so, so, I did, but I didn't come into the guitar until I was 13. And it was my, my cousin, Catherine, she had a, she had a boyfriend who had a guitar and he would come by the house on Walnut street in Winnipeg. And uh, at one point he showed me how to play, play squeeze box by the who. Oh, wow. And it's a three chord song. It's, it's mm-hmm. G C and D. Um, and I was a big fan of the who at the time. And I, and I, he showed me how to do it. And within five minutes, I was strumming the chords at the same, along with Pete Townsend in oh, time. Wow. And I yeah. sounded just like him. And in my mind, I was like, well, this is crazy. This is I mean, only rock stars can do this. And yet I can do this. So I must <laughs> pursue this. So like I, I was, there was a certain ignorance and blindness and naivete, like rock and rolls, three chord rock and rolls, not that hard you can do this, whoever you are. It's not that difficult, but I didn't know that. I thought yet, it must, yet, it must be some I gotta gift. Qualify. You changing chords. Like when you're first starting, 
It's hard. It's hard. Yeah. No, and to sing at the same time, that's hard. And true. if you could do it and sound as good as Pete Townsend, no. maybe you didn't really, but I, you thought you did. Yeah. And I love that you're like, ooh, only rock stars can do is I must be a rock star. It's just going to wait. It's just going to happen. Right? This is uh, well, what we I, think. Yeah. This is exactly kind of what I, yeah. uh, 13-year-old brains. <laughs> well, I think it takes, it, it points to the fact that it takes a certain kind of ignorance and um, naivete uh, to get yourself into the game. Like yeah. people who know more and who have more humility than I had as a 13 year old, uh, they would net, they would have maybe never tried, or they certainly wouldn't have been so, they would not have been so impressed with themselves as I was. And I was so impressed with myself that I spent the next six years practicing eight hours a day because I had to fulfill this destiny, you know? And if, if somebody just said, Hey, it's not that big a deal. Anybody can do that. I would have been like, Oh, okay, fine. I would have gone out on my BMX and I would have broken my wrist again. But instead, I was like, nope, this is special. I have to do this. Uh, so. And you did. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah. I mean, I, my only goals up until not long ago were to have a gig where I would get paid enough money to pay my rent and have to be on time and learn some songs and be a decent human being to people in the process. That was, those are my only goals. Shauna Descartier from Six Shooter Records, who's uh, our, my manager, our manager and record company, she always says, you know, you never, you never shot for the stars. Uh, and I was like, yeah, no, I, I, I did. I never thought finally, she's like, you finally, we collectively finally shot for the moon and that was good, but you never shot for the stars. And I, it's true. I know I was like, I wanted to be able to play like Pete Townsend, not because I thought I was going to be a famous rock star, just because I thought maybe then I could get a gig at a bar down the street and, you know, get free beer and make a hundred bucks. That's all. <laughs> Oh, I hope you can go and play a gig down at the street. But I don't even want to talk about that because I'm in this beautiful uh, memory lane kind of thing. It makes my brain sparkle to hear you talk about all that. Uh, stuff. That's so nice. Um, but I think we're g I'm going to call it because it's almost an hour. And, and um, okay. thank you, Luke, for your stories and for playing on... I don't have the record right here. I should have just done a product placement. Um, I have a copy, but it's 50 feet that way. Yeah, if anybody wants to get the vinyl, you can go to my website and also check out Luke's Whitehorse projects. And he's got some amazing solo records from his past, Deep Dark Past. Or you can maybe even, can you even listen to Veal? No. Yeah, it's on. Yeah, yeah, you can find it on the like Spotify and Apple Music. Go and strangely. see Veal, and we didn't even talk about the in a, maybe possibly inappropriateness of the name, but we won't even talk about that right now. The kind of fuck you, politically correct vegetarians of Vancouver. <laughs> I don't even know if that's what you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> but um, thanks everybody for joining uh, us. And that's that's I, for another podcast entirely. Oh, for sure. Um, so nice to talk to you, Luke. Uh, I hope you and Melissa and Jimmy and Chloe are doing super well and you stay healthy and, um, goodbye. Thank you, Susie. Such a joy to talk to you. Thank you. Congratulations on 20 year anniversary oh, of Sleepy Little Sailor. What an accomplishment. You. What an, what a beautiful legacy. Thank you so much. I, you always make me cry. Okay. Mm. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.